are these images. So this is an image which was actually shown first in December last year. And it shows the kind of cirrus in the Polaris region. There's no evidence of star formation in this area at all. Now, if you zoom in on, 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 on the cirrus here and look in greater detail, then again you see the galactic, extragalactic background. So you, begot, you begin to realize that when you observe the spire instrument in the submillimeter, 253, 5500 micron, you get the extragalactic high redshift universe whether you want it or not. And that's a lesson for you as an observer. Because you will always have, if, if you don't have a, a foreground which is, which is uh, uh, with high opacity, you will get the extragalactic background in your observation. Now, the other region which is completely different is the Aquila Rift. Here you do have a star formation going on in a very big way. Um, and when, when, when you extract the cores in, in the Aquila region, you can conclude that it, they are consistent with Bonnerebus spheroids and they are likely pristellar in nature. When you look at the same thing in the Polaris region, you have to conclude that these clumps are not gravitationally bound and they are not likely, at least not at this point, to become stars. Another way of looking at that is to basically plot the CMF of the clumps. And if you do that in the Aquila region, you get the, the picture you have here. And you can see that it follows basically the IMF, and, and, but it, it, at a higher level. So, so you, can, you, you, can, you can speculate that basically this is going to give rise to an IMF of the shape that you uh, expect. And you, you read the difference between the IMF and the CMF as some kind of efficiency. If you do the same in the Polaris area, you see that the CMF is at a lower mass range than the IMF. And there's no way these clumps are going to make stars unless somehow they could acquire more mass. But they are not gravitationally bound, so it seems difficult. So the authors kind of go to these clouds and they look at the uh, column densities and, and, and they actually do something. They try to look at the column density in filamentary structure and, and they call that the curvelet component. And they do that and then they plot the locations of the stars and you can see that these, or, or I should say the protostellar clumps, and you see that they fall exactly on, these, on the curvelet component of, of the column densities, so the filamentary structures. Um, and if you do the same, well, okay. So the conclusion here is that the gravitational instability in the filamentary structures is the, the air is the place where you create the, the, the clumps that eventually uh, will become stars if it's unstable. And they try to determine a criterion for what makes such a filamentary structure unstable or not. When you look at the Polaris, um, system, you don't, you, you conclude that the filamentary structures that you find there do not fulfill, if you like, the instability criterion. So they are, they are stable in that sense and therefore the authors conclude this is why these filamentary structures do not uh, uh, build stars. Now filamentary structures you have everywhere and the picture on the right here is a Planck image and, and it shows the, the interstellar medium uh, 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 close to the galactic plane. And you see these filamentary structures at all scales, both at large scales, like in the Planck image, and at small scales, like in the Herschel image. OK, so stars form, but they also die. And what you see here are images of, uh, of a few uh, evolved stars, which are losing mass. And looking at one such star in greater detail. Of course, this is perhaps a, a very good example because it's the biggest one we have, but still, uh, when we do spectroscopy on this star with PAX, you get an enormous amount of lines. And in fact, you have a thousand lines and from many different species. And in order to bring some order into this, you need to identify all the lines. But it gets messy, because there's simply too many of them. So we need to zoom in. 
and pull out the wavelength scale. And then you can go through line by line, micron by micron. And this, this, this film takes quite some time, so we're not going to watch it. But I can tell you, it goes like this all the way up to 200 micron. And of course, we also have spire spectroscopy on the same source, uh, although you only see half the range here. So also when it comes to dying stars, we are contributing uh, spectra and images which, uh, which show things you have never seen before. Now, if you really want to go into spectral regime, the shock and awe of Herschel really is the hi-fi instrument. And I have here a spectrum of, uh, of the Orion KL nebula over the entire hi-fi range. Now, if you zoom in onto a small part of it, it looks just the same. So you zoom in again, and it still looks just the same. So you zoom in again, and now you can see the lines and the line shapes. And this is a project by Ted Bergen, and he tells me in his spectral scan there are 100,000 lines. I guess he needs a postdoc. No. <laughs> and this is the most complete spectrum of molecular gas at high spectral resolution ever obtained. Okay, so that's that's star formation and, star di and, star and, and star uh, stars dying close by. But this has, been going on for, this has been going on for 13 billion years, right? So looking out onto this extragalactic confusing background, um, we have several projects doing that. And one of the biggest one, the biggest one in terms of uh, sky uh, real estate coverage is the Herschel Atlas program, which covers more than 500 square degrees. In, in several of the, the well-known fields that you've all heard about from Spitzer and, and so on. Now, this is about four times four degrees. It's about 3% of the total area of this program. This is an observation of about 16 hours. And if you take this green square here and look at it, in a little bit greater detail. You have 6,000 galaxies in this green square. And if you start binning these galaxies with photometric redshifts, you clearly see right away, using the 250 micron luminosity functions here, that as you go back in time, the space density of the most powerful sources increase. As you go further back, you get the higher space density of, of, uh, of, these, uh, of these galaxies. Now, in this particular plot, from this particular program, you only have relatively nearby galaxies uh, with moderate redshifts. But in other programs, we have seen this all the way out to redshift of about two. Now, going deeper, this picture you saw briefly this morning, this is Goods North. This is a, this is a spire image, uh, like the ones you saw before. And there's no noise in this image. We call it the spire carpet. But basically, all the, all, everything you see in this image are galaxies. Now, if you then observe the same area with PAX, of course, you're, you, you, because of, uh, you resolve the confusion even better, and you can go even deeper. And that's what, uh, um, that's what the PAX people under uh, Lutz have done. And if you now look at resolving the cosmic infrared background using PAX. Uh, we have observations in both Goods North and Goods South. And again, it's illustrative to, 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 to see what Herschel can bring compared to the best knowledge that we have at this time. And you see here a good South image uh, obtained with Spitzer. And when you look at the Herschel image in the same region, this is what it looks like. And the increased, the increased uh, resolution enables us to see galaxies for, every, for each redshift range which are less luminous than the ones that you can identify 
in the Spitzer image. And it, will it, it is enabling people to look into the nature of these galaxies, one by one. Now, if you do all the tricks in the book and so on, by stacking and, 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 and confusion analysis and what have you, uh, we are already now resolving more than half of the cosmic infrared background into discrete sources. And so people are, are, are looking at that and trying to understand what kind of sources they are and how they work. And by the way, we also took a look at the most distant quasar known, and we, we detected it. This was done by Meissenheimer et al. And so we have, we have detected this uh, six point, redshift 6.42 quasar as well. And, and uh, so people are, look, uh, are calculating dust temperatures and what have you. Now, I hope I have convinced you and illustrated the fact that Herschel is going where nobody has gone before, and we are seeing what people have not seen before. And if you want to know more about that, because I've only scraped the surface, um, you have to go to our website of the Herschel Science Center. You just Google Herschel Science or Herschel Science Center, and you get there. And what you will find, um, among other things, is a button up here where it says uh, workshops, symposia and workshops. If you go there, you find all the presentations that were given in the workshop we had in ESTEC in May. That's 99 presentations, and, and we also have like 60 posters or, or so on, on the website. Um, and interestingly also, I want to tell you that Herschel is an observatory which is open to the worldwide astronomical community. We have an AO which is open right now with proposal submission deadline on the 22nd of July. And all information about the AO you also find on the website here. I'm coming towards the end of my talk, and I got this picture from Evina a couple of years ago. Um, it is from the, uh, the actual workshop where the proposal to do first, that eventually became Herschel, was written and submitted to ESA. This proposal was submitted to ESA in late 1982. Um, and I want to slow down here and say that the reason we have Herschel today is because a lot of people for a long time have been working hard and diligently. And this is true in academia, this is true in ESA, in industry, and across the world. And even today, people in the Mission Operations Center, the Herschel Science Center, the Instrument Consortia, and in the NASA Herschel Science Center are making this mission possible. And you are invited to join by submitting proposals. So next time we have a big conference, perhaps you will be in the picture. Thank you very much.